The Adventures of Chanticleer and Partlet From Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edwin Taylor and Marion Edward 1. How They Went to the Mountains to Eat Nuts The nuts are quite ripe now, said Chanticleer to his wife, Partlet. Suppose we go together to the mountains, and eat as many as we can, before the squirrel takes them all away. "'With all my heart,' said Partlet, "'let us go and make a holiday of it together.' So they went to the mountains, and, as it was a lovely day, they stayed there till the evening. Now, whether it was that they had eaten so many nuts that they could not walk, or whether they were lazy and would not, I do not know. However, they took it into their heads that it did not become them to go home on foot. So Chanticleer began to build a little carriage of nutshells, and when it was finished Partlet jumped into it and sat down, and bid Chanticleer harness himself to it and draw her home. "'That's a good joke,' said Chanticleer. "'No, that will never do. I would rather by half walk home.' I'll sit on the box and be coachman, if you like, but I'll not draw. While this was passing, a duck came quacking up, and cried out, You thieving vagabonds! What business have you in my grounds? I give it you well for your insolence. And upon that she fell upon Chanticleer most lustily. But Chanticleer was no coward, and returned the duck's blows with his sharp spurs so fiercely that she soon began to cry out for mercy, which was only granted to her upon condition that she would draw the carriage home for them. This she agreed to do, and Chanticleer got upon the box and drove, crying, "'Now, duck, get on as fast as you can!' And away they went, at a pretty good pace. After they had travelled along a little way, they met a needle and a pin walking together along the road, and the needle cried out, "'Stop! Stop!' and said it was so dark that they could hardly find their way, and such dirty walking they could not get on at all. He told them that he and his friend the pin had been at a public house a few miles off, and had sat drinking till they had forgotten how late it was. He begged, therefore, that the travellers would be so kind as to give them a lift in their carriage. Chanticleer, observing that they were but thin fellows, and not likely to take up much room, told them they might ride, but made them promise not to dirty the wheels of the carriage in getting in, nor to tread upon Partlet's toes. Late at night they arrived at an inn, and as it was bad travelling in the dark, and the duck seemed much tired, and waddled about a good deal from one side to the other, they made up their minds to fix their quarters there. But the landlord at first was unwilling, and said his house was full, thinking they might not be very respectable company. However, they spoke civilly to him, and gave him the egg which Partlet had laid by the way, and said they would give him the duck who was in the habit of laying one every day. So at last he let them come in, and they bespoke a handsome supper, and spent the evening very jollily. Early in the morning, before it was quite light, and when nobody was stirring in the inn, Chanticleer awakened his wife, and, fetching the egg, they pecked a hole in it, ate it up, and threw the shells into the fireplace. They then went to the pin and needle, who were fast asleep, and seizing them by the heads, stuck one into the landlord's easy-chair, and the other into his handkerchief, and having done this they crept away as softly as possible. However, the duck, who slept in the open air in the yard, heard them coming, and jumping into the brook which ran close by the inn, soon swam out of their reach. An hour or two afterwards the landlord got up and took his handkerchief to wipe his face, but the pin ran into him and pricked him. Then he walked into the kitchen to light his pipe at the fire, but when he stirred it up the eggshells flew into his eyes and almost blinded him. "'Bless me,' said he, 
all the world seems to have a design against my head this morning and so saying he threw himself sulkily into his easy chair but oh dear the needle ran into him and this time the pain was not in his head he now flew into a very great passion and suspecting the company who had come in the night before he went to look after them but they were all off so he swore that he never again would take in such a troop of vagabonds who ate a great deal paid no reckoning and gave him nothing for his trouble but their apish tricks two how chanticleer and partlet went to visit mr corbus another day chanticleer and partlet wished to ride out together so chanticleer built a handsome carriage with four red wheels and harnessed six mice to it and then he and partlet got into the carriage and away they drove soon afterwards a cat met them and said where are you going and chanticleer replied all on our way a visit to pay to mr corbus the fox to-day then the cat said take me with you chanticleer said with all my heart get up behind and be sure you do not fall off take care of this handsome coach of mine nor dirty my pretty red wheels so fine now mice be ready and wheels run steady for we are going a visit to pay to mr corbus the fox to-day soon after came up a millstone an egg a duck and a pin and chanticleer gave them all leave to get into the carriage and go with them when they arrived at mr corbus's house he was not at home so the mice drew the carriage into the coach-house chanticleer and partlet flew upon a beam the cat sat down in the fireplace the duck got into the washing cistern the pin stuck himself into the red pillow the millstone laid himself over the house door and the egg rolled himself up in the towel when mr corbus came home he went to the fireplace to make a fire but the cat threw all the ashes in his eyes so he ran to the kitchen to wash himself but there the duck splashed all the water in his face and when he tried to wipe himself the egg broke to pieces in the towel all over his face and eyes then he was very angry and went without his supper to bed but when he laid his head on the pillow the pin ran into his cheek at this he became quite furious and jumping up would have run out of the house but when he came to the door the millstone fell down on his head and killed him on the spot three how partlet died and was buried and how chanticleer died of grief another day chanticleer and partlet agreed to go again to the mountains to eat nuts and it was settled that all the nuts which they found should be shared equally between them now partlet found a very large nut but she said nothing about it to chanticleer and kept it all to herself however it was so big that she could not swallow it and it stuck in her throat then she was in a great fright and cried out to chanticleer pray run as fast as you can and fetch me some water or i shall be choked chanticleer ran as fast as he could to the river and said river give me some water for partlet lies in the mountain and will be choked by a great nut the river said run first to the bride and ask her for a silken cord to draw up the water chanticleer ran to the bride and said bride you must give me a silken cord for then the river will give me water and the water i will give to partlet who lies on the mountain and will be choked by a great nut but the bride said run first and bring me my garland that is hanging on a willow in the garden then chanticleer ran to the garden and took the garland from the bough where it hung and brought it to the bride and then the bride gave him the silken cord and he took the silken cord of the river and the river gave him water and he carried the water to partlet but in the meantime she was choked by the great nut and lay quite dead and never moved any more 
Then Chanticleer was very sorry, and cried bitterly, and all the beasts came and wept with him over poor Bartlett, and six mice built a little hearse to carry her to her grave, and when it was ready they harnessed themselves before it, and Chanticleer drove them. On the way they met the fox. "'Where are you going, Chanticleer?' said he. "'To bury my partlet,' said the other. "'May I go with you?' said the fox. "'Yes, but you must get up behind, or my horses will not be able to draw you.' Then the fox got up behind, and presently the wolf, the bear, the goat, and all the beasts of the wood came and climbed upon the hearse. So on they went, till they came to a rapid stream. "'How shall we get over?' said Chanticleer. Then said a straw, "'I will lay myself across, and you may pass over upon me.' But as the mice were going over, the straw slipped away and fell into the water, and the six mice all fell in and were drowned. What was to be done? Then a large log of wood came, and said, oh, I am big enough. I will lay myself across the stream, and you shall pass over upon me. So he laid himself down, but they managed so clumsily that the log of wood fell in, and was carried away by the stream. Then a stone, who saw what had happened, came up and kindly offered to help poor Chanticleer by laying himself across the stream. And this time he got safely to the other side with the hearse, and managed to get partlet out of it. But the fox and the other mourners, who were sitting behind, were too heavy, and fell back into the water, and were all carried away by the stream, and drowned. Thus Chanticleer was left alone with his dead partlet and having dug a grave for her, he laid her in it, and made a little hillock over her. Then he sat down by the grave, and wept and mourned, till at last he died too, and so all were dead. End of The Adventures of Chanticleer and Partlet Rapunzel from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. There were once a man and a woman who had long in vain wished for a child. At length the woman hoped that God was about to grant her desire. These people had a little window at the back of their house, from which a splendid garden could be seen, which was full of the most beautiful flowers and herbs. It was, however, surrounded by a high wall, and no one dared to go into it because it belonged to an enchantress, who had great power and was dreaded by all the world. One day the woman was standing by this window and looking down into the garden, but she saw a bed which was planted with the most beautiful rambian, and it looked so fresh and green that she longed for it. She quite pined away, and began to look pale and miserable. Then her husband was alarmed, and asked, "'What ails you, dear wife?' "'Ah,' she replied, "'if I can't eat some of the rampion which is in the garden behind our house, I shall die.' The man, who loved her, thought, "'Sooner than let your wife die, bring her some of the rampion yourself, let it cost what it will.' At twilight he clambered down over the wall into the garden of the enchantress, hastily clutched a handful of rampion, and took it to his wife. She at once made herself a salad of it, and ate it greedily. It tasted so good to her so very good, that the next day she longed for it three times as much as before. If he was to have any rest, her husband must once more descend into the garden. In the gloom of evening, therefore, he let himself down again. But when he had clambered down the wall he was terribly afraid, 
for he saw the enchantress standing before him. "'How can you dare,' said she, with angry look, "'descend into my garden and steal my rampion like a thief? You shall suffer for it.' "'Ah!' answered he, "'let mercy take the place of justice. I only made up my mind to do it for necessity. My wife saw your rampion from the window, and felt such a longing for it, that she would have died if she had not got some to eat. Then the enchantress allowed her anger to be softened, and said to him, If the case be as you say, I will allow you to take away with you as much rampion as you will. Only I make one condition. You must give me the child which your wife will bring into the world. It shall be well treated, and I will care for it like a mother. The man, in his terror, consented to everything, and when the woman was brought to bed, the enchantress appeared at once, gave the child the name of Rapunzel, and took it away with her. Rapunzel grew into the most beautiful child under the sun. When she was twelve years old, the enchantress shut her into a tower, which lay in a forest, and had neither stairs nor door, but quite at the top was a little window. When the enchantress wanted to go in, she placed herself beneath it, and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Rapunzel had magnificent long hair fine as spun gold, and when she heard the voice of the enchantress she unfastened her braided tresses, wound them round one of the hooks of the window above, and then the hair fell twenty ells down, and the enchantress climbed up by it. After a year or two it came to pass that the king's son rode through the forest and passed by the tower. Then he heard a song which was so charming that he stood still and listened. This was Rapunzel, who in her solitude passed her time in letting her sweet voice resound. The king's son wanted to climb up to her, and looked for the door of the tower, but none was to be found. He rode home, but the singing had so deeply touched his heart that every day he went out into the forest and listened to it. Once, when he was thus standing behind a tree, he saw that an enchantress came there, and he heard how she cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Then Rapunzel let down the braids of her hair, and the enchantress climbed up to her. If that is the ladder by which one mounts, I too will try my fortune, said he, and the next day, when it began to grow dark, he went to the tower and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Immediately the hair fell down, and the king's son climbed up. At first Rapunzel was terribly frightened when a man, such as her eyes had never yet beheld, came to her. But the king's son began to talk to her quite like a friend and told her that his heart had been so stirred that it had let him have no rest, and he had been forced to see her. Then Rapunzel lost her fear, and when he asked her if she would take him for her husband, and she saw that he was young and handsome, she thought, He will love me more than old Dame Gothel does. And she said yes, and laid her hand in his. She said, I will willingly go away with you, but I do not know how to get down. Bring with you a skein of milk every time that you come, and I will weave a ladder with it, and when that is ready I will descend, and you will take me on your horse. They agreed that until that time he should come to her every evening, for the old woman came by day. The enchantress remarked nothing of this, until once Rapunzel said to her, Tell me, Dame Gothel, how it happens that you are so much heavier for me to draw up than the young king's son. He is with me in a moment. Ah, you wicked child, cried the enchantress, what do I hear you say? I thought I had separated you from all the world, 
and yet you have deceived me. In her anger she clutched Rapunzel's beautiful tresses, wrapped them twice around her left hand, seized a pair of scissors with the right, and snip-snap they were cut off, and the lovely braids lay on the ground. And she was so pitiless that she took poor Rapunzel into a desert, where she had to live in great grief and misery. On the same day that she had cast out Rapunzel, however, the enchantress fastened the braids of hair, which she had cut off, to the hook of the window, and when the king's son came and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. She let the hair down. The king's son ascended, but instead of finding his dearest Rapunzel, he found the enchantress, who gazed at him with wicked and venomous looks. Aha! she cried mockingly. You would fetch your dearest, but the beautiful bird sits no longer singing in the nest. The cat has got it, and will scratch out your eyes as well. Rapunzel is lost to you. You will never see her again. The king's son was beside himself with pain, and in his despair he leapt down from the tower. He escaped with his life, but the thorns into which he fell pierced his eyes. Then he wandered quite blind about the forest, ate nothing but roots and berries, and did naught but lament and weep over the loss of his dearest wife. Thus he roamed about in misery for some years, and at length came to the desert where Rapunzel, with the twins to which she had given birth, a boy and a girl, lived in wretchedness. He heard a voice, and it seemed so familiar to him that he went towards it, and when he approached, Rapunzel knew him, and fell on his neck, and wept. Two of her tears wetted his eyes, and they grew clear again, and he could see with them as before. He led her to his kingdom, where he was joyfully received, and they lived a long time afterwards, happy and contented. End of Rapunzel Fundevogel from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. There once was a forester who went into the forest to hunt, and as he entered it he heard a sound of screaming, as if a little child were there. He followed the sound, and at last came to a high tree, and at the top of this a little child was sitting, for the mother had fallen asleep under the tree with the child, and a bird of prey had seen it in her arms, had flown down, snatched it away, and set it on the high tree. The forester climbed up, brought the child down, and thought to himself, You will take him home with you, and bring him up with your Lena. He took it home, therefore, and the two children grew up together, and the one which he had found on a tree was called Fundafogel, because a bird had carried it away. Fundafogel and Lena loved each other so dearly that when they did not see each other they were sad. Now the forester had an old cook, who one evening took two pails and began to fetch water, and did not go once only, but many times out to the spring. Lena saw this, and said, Listen, old Sana, why are you fetching so much water? If you will never repeat it to anyone, I will tell you why. So Lena said no, she would never repeat it to anyone and then the cook said, Early to-morrow morning, when the forester is out hunting, I will heat the water, and when it is boiling in the kettle, I will throw in the Fundevogel, and will boil him in it. Early next morning the forester got up and went out hunting, and when he was gone the children were still in bed. Then Lena said to Fundevogel, If you will never leave me, I too will never leave you. 
Von de Vogel said, Neither now nor ever will I leave you. Then said Lena, Then will I tell you. Last night old Sanna carried so many buckets of water into the house that I asked her why she was doing that, and she said that if I would promise not to tell any one, and she said that early to-morrow morning, when father was out hunting, she would set the kettle full of water, throw you into it, and boil you. But we will get up quickly, dress ourselves, and go away together. The two children therefore got up, dressed themselves quickly, and went away. When the water in the kettle was boiling, the cook went into the bedroom to fetch Fundevogel and throw him into it. But when she came in and went to the beds, both the children were gone. Then she was terribly alarmed, and she said to herself, What shall I say now when the forester comes home and sees that the children are gone? They must be followed instantly to get them back again. Then the cook sent three servants after them who were to run and overtake the children. The children, however, were sitting outside the forest, and when they saw from afar the three servants running, Lena said to Fundevogel, Never leave me, and I will never leave you. Fundevogel said, Neither now nor ever. Then said Lena, Do you become a rose-tree, and I the rose upon it? When the three servants came to the forest, nothing was there but a rose-tree, and one rose on it. But the children were nowhere. Then said they, There is nothing to be done here. And they went home and told the cook that they had seen nothing in the forest but a little rose-bush with one rose on it. Then the old cook scolded, and said, You simpletons! You should have cut the rose-bush in two, and have broken off the rose, and brought it home with you. Go, and do it at once." They had therefore to go out and look for the second time. The children, however, saw them coming from a distance. Then Lena said, Fundevogel, never leave me, and I will never leave you. Fundevogel said, Neither now nor ever. Said Lena, then do you become a church, and I'll be the chandelier in it. So when the three servants came, nothing was there but a church with a chandelier in it. They said therefore to each other, What can we do here? Let us go home. When they got home, the cook asked if they had not found them. So they said no, they had found nothing but a church, and there was a chandelier in it and the cook scolded them, and said, You fools! Why did you not pull the church to pieces, and bring the chandelier home with you? And now the old cook herself got on her legs, and went with the three servants in pursuit of the children. The children, however, saw from afar that the three servants were coming, and the cook waddling after them. Then said Lena, Fundevogel, never leave me, and I will never leave you. Then said Fundevogel, Neither now nor ever. Said Lena, Be a fish-pond, and I will be the duck upon it. The cook, however, came up to them, and when she saw the pond she lay down by it, and was about to drink it up. But the duck swam quickly to her, seized her head in its beak, and drew her into the water, and there the old witch had to drown. Then the children went home together, and were heartily delighted, and, if they have not died, they are living still. End of Fundevogel The Valiant Little Tailor From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. One summer morning a little tailor was sitting on his table by the window. He was in good spirits, and sewed with all his might. Then came a peasant woman down the street, crying, 
good jams cheap good jams cheap this rang pleasantly in the tailor's ears he stretched his delicate head out of the window and called come up here dear woman here you will get rid of your goods the woman came up the three steps to the tailor with her heavy basket and he made her unpack all the pots for him he inspected each one lifted it up put his nose to it and at length said the jam seems to me to be good so weigh me out four ounces dear woman and if it is a quarter of a pound that is of no consequence the woman who had hoped to find a good sale gave him what he desired but went away quite angry and grumbling now this jam shall be blessed by god cried the little tailor and give me health and strength so he brought the bread out of the cupboard cut himself a piece right across the loaf and spread the jam over it this won't taste bitter said he but i will just finish the jacket before i take a bite he laid the bread near him sewed on and in his joy made bigger and bigger stitches in the meantime the smell of the sweet jam rose to where the flies were sitting in great numbers and they were attracted and descended on it in hosts hi who invited you said the little tailor and drove the unbidden guests away the flies however who understood no english would not be turned away but came back again in ever-increasing companies the little tailor at last lost all patience and drew a piece of cloth from the hole under his work-table and saying wait and i will give it to you struck it mercilessly on them when he drew it away and counted there lay before him no fewer than seven dead and with legs stretched out are you a fellow of that sort said he and he could not help admiring his own bravery the whole town shall know of this and the little tailor hastened to cut himself a girdle stitched it and embroidered out in large letters seven at one stroke what the town he continued the whole world shall hear of it and his heart wagged with joy like a lamb's tail the tailor put on the girdle and resolved to go forth into the world because he thought his workshop was too small for his valour before he went away he sought about in the house to see if there was anything which he could take with him however he found nothing but an old cheese and that he put in his pocket in front of the door he observed a bird which had caught itself in the thicket it had to go into his pocket with the cheese now he took to the road boldly and as he was light and nimble he felt no fatigue the road led him up a mountain and when he had reached the highest point of it there sat a powerful giant looking peacefully about him the little tailor went bravely up spoke to him and said good day comrade so you are sitting there overlooking the widespread world i am just on my way thither and want to try my luck have you any inclination to go with me the giant looked contemptuously at the tailor and said you ragamuffin you miserable creature oh indeed answered the little tailor and unbuttoned his coat and showed the giant the girdle there may you read what kind of man i am the giant read seven at one stroke and thought that they had been men whom the tailor had killed and began to feel a little respect for the tiny fellow nevertheless he wished to try him first and took a stone in his hand and squeezed it together so that water dropped out of it do that likewise said the giant if you have strength is that all said the tailor that is child's play with me and put his hand into his pocket brought out the soft cheese and pressed it until the liquid ran out of it faith said he that was a little better wasn't it the giant did not know what to say 
and could not believe it of the little man. Then the giant picked up a stone and threw it so high that the eye could scarcely follow it. Now, little mite of a man, do that likewise. Well thrown, said the tailor, but after all the stone came down to earth again. I will throw you one which shall never come back at all. And he put his hand into his pocket, took out the bird, and threw it into the air. The bird, delighted with its liberty, rose, flew away, and did not come back. "'How does that shot please you, comrade?' asked the tailor. Uh, "'You can certainly throw,' said the giant. "'But now we will see if you are able to carry anything properly.' He took the little tailor to a mighty oak tree which lay there felled on the ground, and said, "'If you are strong enough, help me to carry the tree out of the forest.' Oh, "'Readily!' answered the little man. Take you the trunk on your shoulders, and I will raise up the branches and twigs. After all, they are the heaviest. The giant took the trunk on his shoulder, but the tailor seated himself on a branch, and the giant, who could not look round, had to carry away the whole tree, and the little tailor into the bargain. He, behind, was quite merry and happy, and whistled the song, Three tailors rode forth from the gate, as if carrying the tree were child's play. The giant, after he had dragged the heavy burden part of the way, could go no further, and cried, Hark you! I shall have to let the tree fall. The tailor sprang nimbly down, seized the tree with both arms as if he had been carrying it, and said to the giant, You are such a great fellow! and yet cannot even carry the tree. They went on together, and as they passed a cherry tree, the giant laid hold of the top of the tree where the ripest fruit was hanging, bent it down, gave it into the tailor's hand, and bade him eat. But the little tailor was much too weak to hold the tree, and when the giant let it go, it sprang back again, and the tailor was tossed into the air with it. When he had fallen down again without injury, the giant said, "'What is this? Have you not strength enough to hold the weak twig?' "'There is no lack of strength,' answered the little tailor. "'Do you think that could be anything to a man who has struck down seven at one blow? I leaped over the tree because the huntsmen were shooting down there in the thicket. Jump as I did, if you can do it.' The giant made the attempt, but he could not get over the tree, and remained hanging in the branches, so that in this also the tailor kept the upper hand. The giant said, "'If you are such a valiant fellow, come with me into our cavern and spend the night with us.' The little tailor was willing, and followed him. When they went into the cave, other giants were sitting there by the fire, and each of them had a roasted sheep in his hand and was eating it. The little tailor looked round and thought, It is much more spacious here than in my workshop. The giant showed him a bed, and said he was to lie down in it and sleep. The bed, however, was too big for the little tailor. He did not lie down in it, but crept into a corner. When it was midnight, and the giant thought that the little tailor was lying in a sound sleep, he got up, took a great iron bar, cut through the bed with one blow, and thought he had finished off the grasshopper for good. With the earliest dawn the giants went into the forest, and had quite forgotten the little tailor, when all at once he walked up to them quite merrily and boldly. The giants were terrified. They were afraid that he would strike them all dead, and ran away in a great hurry. The little tailor went onward, always following his own pointed nose. After he had walked for a long time, he came to the courtyard of a royal palace, and as he felt weary, he lay down on the grass and fell asleep. Whilst he lay there, the people came and inspected him on all sides, and read on his girdle, Seven at one stroke. Ah! said they. What does the great warrior want here in the midst of peace? 
he must be a mighty lord they went and announced him to the king and gave it as their opinion that if war should break out this would be a weighty and useful man who ought on no account to be allowed to depart the council pleased the king and he sent one of his courtiers to the little tailor to offer him military service when he awoke the ambassador remained standing by the sleeper waited until he stretched his limbs and opened his eyes and then conveyed to him his proposal for this very reason have i come here the tailor replied i am ready to enter the king's service he was therefore honourably received and a special dwelling was assigned him the soldiers however were set against the little tailor and wished him a thousand miles away what is to be the end of this they said among themselves if we quarrel with him and he strikes about him the seven of us will fall at every blow not one of us can stand against him they came therefore to a decision they took themselves in a body to the king and begged for their dismissal we are not prepared said they to stay with a man who kills seven at one stroke the king was sorry that for the sake of one he should lose all his faithful servants, wished that he had never set eyes on the tailor, and would willingly have been rid of him again. But he did not venture to give him his dismissal, for he dreaded lest he should strike him and all his people dead, and place himself on the royal throne. He thought about it for a long time, and at last found good counsel he sent to the little tailor and caused him to be informed that as he was a great warrior he had one request to make to him in a forest of his country lived two giants who caused great mischief with their robbing murdering ravaging and burning and no one could approach them without putting himself in danger of death if the tailor conquered and killed these two giants he would give him his only daughter to wife and half of his kingdom as a dowry likewise one hundred horsemen would go with him to assist him that would indeed be a fine thing for a man like me thought the little tailor one is not offered a beautiful princess and half a kingdom every day of one's life oh yes he replied i will soon subdue the giants and do not require the help of the hundred horsemen to do it. He who can hit seven with one blow has no need to be afraid of two. The little tailor went forth, and the hundred horsemen followed him. When he came to the outskirts of the forest, he said to his followers, Just stay waiting here. I alone will soon finish off the giants. Then he bounded into the forest, and looked about right and left. After a while he perceived both giants. They lay sleeping under a tree, and snored so that the branches waved up and down. The little tailor, not idle, gathered two pockets full of stones, and with these climbed up the tree. When he was halfway up, he slipped down by a branch until he'd sat just above the sleepers, and then let one stone after another fall on the breast of one of the giants. For a long time the giant felt nothing, but at last he awoke, pushed his comrade, and said, "'Why are you knocking me?' "'You must be dreaming,' said the other. "'I am not knocking you.' They laid themselves down to sleep again, and then the tailor threw a stone down on the second. "'What is the meaning of this?' cried the other. "'Why are you pelting me?' "'I am not pelting you,' answered the first, growling. They disputed about it for a time, but as they were weary they let the matter rest and their eyes closed once more. The little tailor began his game again, picked out the biggest stone, and threw it with all his might on the breast of the first giant. "'That is too bad!' cried he, and sprang up like a madman, and pushed his companion against the tree until it shook. The other paid him back in the same coin, 
and they got into such a rage that they tore up trees, and belaboured each other so long that at last they both fell down dead on the ground at the same time. Then the little tailor leaped down. "'It's a lucky thing,' said he, "'that they did not tear up the tree on which I was sitting, or I should have had to sprint on to another like a squirrel. But we tailors are nimble.' He drew out his sword, and gave each one of them a couple of thrusts in his breast, and then went out to the horseman, and said, "'The work is done. I have finished both of them. But it was hard work. They tore up trees in their sore need, and defended themselves with them. But all that is to no purpose when a man like myself comes, who can kill seven at one blow.' "'But are you wounded?' asked the horseman. "'You need not concern yourself about that,' answered the tailor. "'They have not bent one hair of mine.' The horseman could not believe him, and rode into the forest. There they found the giants swimming in their blood, and all round about lay the torn-up trees. The little tailor demanded of the king the promised reward. He, however, repented of his promise and again bethought himself how he could get rid of him. "'Before you receive my daughter and half of my kingdom,' said he to him, "'you must perform one more heroic deed. In the forest roams a unicorn which does great harm, and you must catch it first. "'I fear one unicorn still less than two giants. Seven at one blow is my kind of affair.' He took a rope and axe with him, went forth into the forest, and again bade those who were sent with him to wait outside. He had not long to seek. The unicorn soon came towards him, and rushed directly on the tailor, as if it would gore him with its horn without more ado. "'Softly, softly, it can't be done as quickly as that,' said he and stood still and waited until the animal was quite close, and then sprang nimbly behind the tree. The unicorn ran against the tree with all its strength, and stuck its horn so fast in the trunk that it had not the strength enough to draw it out again, and thus it was caught. "'Now I have got the bird,' said the tailor, and came out from behind the tree and put the rope round its neck and then with his axe he hewed the horn out of the tree, and when all was ready he led the beast away and took it to the king. The king still would not give him the promised reward, and made a third demand. Before the wedding the tailor was to catch him a wild boar that made great havoc in the forest, and the huntsmen should give him their help. "'Willingly,' said the tailor, "'that is child's play.' He did not take the huntsman with him into the forest, and they were well pleased that he did not, for the wild boar had several times received them in such a manner that they had no inclination to lie and wait for him. When the boar perceived the tailor, it ran on him with foaming mouth and wetted tusks, and was about to throw him to the ground, but the hero fled and sprang into a chapel which was near and up to the window at once, and in one bound out again. The boar ran after him, but the tailor ran round outside and shut the door behind it. And then the raging beast, which was much too heavy and awkward to leap out of the window, was caught. The little tailor called the huntsmen thither that they might see the prisoner with their own eyes. The hero, however, went to the king, who was now, whether he liked it or not, obliged to keep his promise, and gave his daughter and the half of his kingdom. Had he known that it was no warlike hero, but a little tailor who was standing before him, it would have gone to his heart still more than it did. The wedding was held with great magnificence and small joy, and out of the tailor a king was made. After some time the young queen heard her husband say in his dreams at night, "'Boy, make me the doublet and patch the pantaloons, or else I will wrap the yard measure over your ears.' 
Then she discovered in what state of life the young lord had been born, and the next morning complained of her wrongs to her father, and begged him to help her to get rid of her husband, who was nothing else but a tailor. The king comforted her, and said, Leave your bedroom door open this night, and my servants shall stand outside, and when he has fallen asleep shall go in, bind him, and take him on board a ship, which shall carry him into the wide world. The woman was satisfied with this, but the king's armor-bearer, who had heard all, was friendly with the young lord, and informed him of the whole plot. "'I'll put a screw into that business,' said the little tailor. At night he went to bed with his wife at the usual time, and when she thought he had fallen asleep, she got up, opened the door, and then lay down again. The little tailor, who was only pretending to be asleep, began to cry out in a clear voice, "'Boy, make me the doublet, and patch me the pantaloons, or I will wrap the yard measure over your ears. I smote seven at one blow, I killed two giants, I brought away one unicorn, and caught a wild boar. And am I to fear those who are standing outside the room?' When these men heard the tailor speaking thus, they were overcome by a great dread, and ran as if the wild huntsmen were behind them, and none of them would venture anything further against him. So the little tailor was and remained a king to the end of his life. End of The Valiant Little Tailor Hansel and Gretel from Grimm's Fairy Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld Hard by a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter, with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel, and the girl Gretel. He had little to bite and to break, and once, when great dearth fell on the land, he could no longer procure even daily bread. Now, when he thought over this by night in his bed, and tossed about in his anxiety, he groaned and said to his wife, "'What is to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children, when we no longer have anything even for ourselves?' "'I'll tell you what, husband,' answered the woman. "'Early to-morrow morning we will take the children out into the forest to where it is the thickest. There we will light a fire for them, and give each of them one more piece of bread. And then we will go to our work, and leave them alone. They will not find the way home again, and we shall be rid of them.' "'No, wife,' said the man, "'I will not do that.' How can I bear to leave my children alone in the forest? The wild animals would soon come and tear them to pieces. Oh, you fool, said she, then we must all four die of hunger. You may as well plane the planks for our coffins. And she left him no peace until he consented. But I feel very sorry for the poor children all the same, said the man. The two children had also not been able to sleep for hunger, and had heard what their stepmother had said to their father. Gretel wept bitter tears, and said to Hansel, "'Now is all over with us.' "'Be quiet, Gretel,' said Hansel. "'Do not distress yourself. I will soon find a way to help us.' And when the old folks had fallen asleep, he got up, put on his little coat, opened the door below, and crept outside. The moon shone brightly, and the white pebbles which lay in front of the house glittered like real silver pennies. Hansel stooped and stuffed the little pocket of his coat with as many as he could get in. And he went back, and said to Gretel, "'Be comforted, dear little sister, and sleep in peace. God will not forsake us.' and he lay down again in his bed. When day dawned, but before the sun had risen, 
the woman came and awoke the two children, saying, "'Get up, you sluggards! We are going into the forest to fetch wood.' She gave each a little piece of bread, and said, "'There is something for your dinner, but do not eat it up before then, for you will get nothing else.' Gretel took the bread under her apron, as Hansel had the pebbles in his pocket. Then they all set out together on the way to the forest. When they had walked a short time, Hansel stood still and peeped back at the house, and did so again and again. His father said, "'Hansel, what are you looking at there and staying behind for? Pay attention, and do not forget how to use your legs.' "'Ah, father,' said Hansel, "'I am looking at my little white cat, which is sitting up on the roof and wants to say good-bye to me.' The wife said, "'Fool, fool! That is not your little cat. That is the morning sun which is shining on the chimneys.' Hansel, however, had not been looking back at the cat, but had been constantly throwing one of the white pebble-stones out of his pocket on the road. When they had reached the middle of the forest, the father said, "'Now, children, pile up some wood, and I will light a fire that you may not be cold.' Hansel and Gretel gathered brushwood together, as high as a little hill. The brushwood was lighted, and when the flames were burning very high, the woman said, "'Now, children, lay yourselves down by the fire and rest. We will go into the forest and cut some wood. When we have done, we will come back and fetch you away.' Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire, and when noon came, each ate a little piece of bread and as they heard the strokes of the wood-axe they believed that their father was near. It was not the axe, however, but a branch which he had fastened to a withered tree which the wind was blowing backwards and forwards, and as they had been sitting such a long time their eyes closed with fatigue, and they fell fast asleep. When at last they awoke it was already dark night. Gretel began to cry, and said, how are we to get out of the forest now? But Hansel comforted her, and said, Just wait a little, until the moon has risen, and then we will soon find the way. And when the full moon had risen, Hansel took his little sister by the hand, and followed the pebbles, which shone like newly coined silver pieces, and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long, and by break of day came once more to their father's house. They knocked at the door, and when the woman opened it, and saw it was Hansel and Gretel, she said, "'You naughty children! Why have you slept so long in the forest? We thought you were never coming back at all.' The father, however, rejoiced, for it had cut him to the heart to leave them behind alone. Not long afterwards there was once more great dearth throughout the land, and the children heard their mother saying at night to their father, "'Everything is eaten again. We have one half-loaf left, and that is the end. The children must go. We will take them farther into the wood, so that they will not find their way out again. There is no other means of saving ourselves.' The man's heart was heavy, and he thought, it would be better for you to share the last mouthful with your children. The woman, however, would listen to nothing that he had to say, but scolded and reproached him. He who says A must say B likewise, and as he had yielded the first time, he had to do so a second time also. The children, however, were still awake, and had heard the conversation. When the old folks were asleep, Hansel again got up and wanted to go out and pick up pebbles, as he had done before. But the woman had locked the door, and Hansel could not get out. Nevertheless he comforted his little sister, and said, "'Do not cry, Gretel. Go to sleep quietly. The good God will help us.' Early in the morning came the woman, and took the children out of their beds. Their piece of bread was given to them, but it was still smaller than the time before. On the way into the forest Hansel crumbled his in his pocket, and often stood still and threw a morsel on the ground. "'Hansel, why do you stop and look round?' said the father. "'Go on.' 
I am looking back at my little pigeon, which is sitting on the roof, and wants to say good-bye to me, answered Hansel. Fool, said the woman, that is not your little pigeon. That is the morning sun that is shining on the chimney. Hansel, however, little by little, threw all the crumbs on the path. The woman led the children still deeper into the forest, where they had never in their lives been before. Then a great fire was again made, and the mother said, Just sit here, you children, and when you are tired you may sleep a little. We are going into the forest to cut wood, and in the evening, when we are done, we will come and fetch you away. When it was noon, Gretel shared her piece of bread with Hansel, who had scattered his by the way. Then they fell asleep. An evening passed, but no one came to the poor children. They did not awake until it was dark night, and Hansel comforted his little sister and said, "'Just wait, Gretel, until the moon rises, and then we shall see the crumbs of bread which I have strewn about. They will show us our way home again.' When the moon came, they set out, but they found no crumbs, for the many thousands of birds which fly about in the woods and fields had picked them all up. Hansel said to Gretel, We shall soon find the way. But they did not find it. They walked the whole night and all the next day, too, from morning till evening, but they did not get out of the forest, and were very hungry for they had nothing to eat but two or three berries which grew on the ground. And as they were so weary that their legs would carry them no longer, they laid down beneath a tree and fell asleep. It was now three mornings since they had left their father's house. They began to walk again, but they always came deeper into the forest, and if help did not come soon, they must die of hunger and weariness. When it was midday, they saw a beautiful snow-white bird sitting on a bough, which sang so delightfully that they stood still and listened to it. And when its song was over, it spread its wings and flew away before them, and they followed it until they reached a little house, on the roof of which it alighted. And when they approached the little house, they saw that it was built of bread, covered with cakes, but that the windows were of clear sugar. "'We will set to work on that,' said Hansel, "'and have a good meal. "'I will eat a bit of the roof, "'and you, Gretel, can eat some of the window. "'It will taste sweet.' Hansel reached up above and broke off a little of the roof to try how it tasted, and Gretel leant against the window and nibbled at the panes. Then a soft voice cried from the parlour, "'Nibble, nibble, gnaw!' Who is nibbling at my little house? The children answered, The wind, the wind, the heaven-born wind, and went on eating without disturbing themselves. Hansel, who liked the taste of the roof, tore down a great piece of it, and Gretel pushed out the hole of one round window-pane, sat down, and enjoyed herself with it. Suddenly the door opened, and a woman as old as the hills, who supported herself on crutches, came creeping out. Hansel and Gretel were so terribly frightened that they let fall what they had in their hands. The old woman, however, nodded her head and said, "'Oh, you dear children, who has brought you here? Do come in and stay with me. No harm shall happen to you.' She took them both by the hand and led them into her little house. Then good food was set before them, milk and pancakes, with sugar, apples, and nuts. Afterwards two pretty little beds were covered with clean white linen, and Hansel and Gretel lay down in them, and thought they were in heaven. The old woman had only pretended to be so kind. She was in reality a wicked witch, who lay in wait for children and had only built the little house of bread in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked, and ate it, and that was a feast day with her. Witches have red eyes and cannot see far, but they have a keen scent like the beasts, and are aware when human beings draw near. 
When Hansel and Gretel came into her neighborhood, she laughed with malice, and said mockingly, "'I have them. They shall not escape me again.' Early in the morning, before the children were awake, she was already up. When she saw both of them sleeping and looking so pretty, with their plump and rosy cheeks, she muttered to herself, "'That will be a dainty mouthful!' Then she seized Hansel with her shriveled hand, carried him into a little stable, and locked him in behind a grated door. Scream as he might, it would not help him. Then she went to Gretel shook her till she awoke, and cried, "'Get up, lazy thing! Fetch some water, and cook something good for your brother. He is in the stable outside, and is to be made fat. When he is fat, I will eat him.' Gretel began to weep bitterly, but it was all in vain, for she was forced to do what the wicked witch commanded and now the best food was cooked for poor Hansel, but Gretel got nothing but crab-shells. Every morning the woman crept to the little stable and cried, "'Hansel, stretch out your finger, that I may feel if you will soon be fat.' Hansel, however, stretched out a little bone to her, and the old woman, who had dim eyes, could not see it, and thought it was Hansel's finger, and was astonished that there was no way of fattening him. When four weeks had gone by, and Hansel still remained thin, she was seized with impatience, and would not wait any longer. "'Now then, Gretel,' she cried to the girl, "'stir yourself, and bring me some water. Let Hansel be fat or lean. Tomorrow I will kill him, and cook him.' Ah, how the poor little sister did lament when she had to fetch the water, and how her tears did flow down her cheeks. "'Dear God, do help us!' she cried. "'If the wild beasts in the forest had but devoured us, we should at any rate have died together.' "'Just keep your noise to yourself,' said the old woman. "'It won't help you at all.' Early in the morning Gretel had to go out and hang up the cauldron with the water, and light the fire. "'We will bake first said the old woman. I have already heated the oven, and kneaded the dough. She pushed dear Gretel out to the oven, from which flames of the fire were already darting. Creep in, said the witch, and see if it is properly heated, so that we can put the bread in. And once Gretel was inside, she intended to shut the oven and let her bake in it, and then she would eat her, too. But Gretel saw what she had in mind, and said, "'I do not know how I am to do it. How do I get in?' "'Silly goose,' said the old woman, "'the door is big enough. Just look, I can get in myself.' And she crept up and thrust her head into the oven. Then Gretel gave her a push that drove her far into it, and shut the iron door, and fastened the bolt. Oh, then she began to howl quite horribly, but Gretel ran away, and the godless witch was miserably burnt to death. Gretel, however, ran like lightning to Hansel, opened his little stable, and cried, "'Hansel, we are saved! The old witch is dead!' Then Hansel sprang like a bird from its cage when the door is opened. How they did rejoice and embrace each other, and dance about and kiss each other! and as they had no longer any need to fear her, they went into the witch's house, and in every corner there stood chests full of pearls and jewels. "'These are far better than pebbles,' said Hansel, and thrust into his pockets whatever he could get in. And Gretel said, "'I too will take something home with me,' and filled her pinafore full. "'But now we must be off,' said Hansel, "'that we may get out of the witch's forest.' When they had walked for two hours, they came to a great stretch of water. "'We cannot cross,' said Hansel. "'I see no foot-plank and no bridge.' "'And there is also no ferry,' answered Gretel. "'But a white duck is swimming there. If I ask her, she will help us over.' Then she cried, 
Little duck, little duck, dost thou see Hansel and Gretel are waiting for thee? There's never a plank or a bridge in sight. Take us across on thy back so white. The duck came to them, and Hansel seated himself on its back and told his sister to sit by him. No, replied Gretel, that will be too heavy for the little duck. She will take us across one after the other. The good little duck did so, and when they were once safely across and had walked for a short time, the forest seemed to be more and more familiar to them, and at length they saw from afar their father's house. Then they began to run, rushed into the parlour, and threw themselves round their father's neck. The man had not known one happy hour since he had left the children in the forest. The woman, however, was dead. Gretel emptied her pinafore until pearls and precious stones ran about the room, and Hansel threw one handful after another out of his pocket to add to them. Then all anxiety was at an end, and they lived together in perfect happiness. My tale is done. There runs a mouse. Whosoever catches it may make himself a big fur cap out of it. End of Hansel and Gretel The Mouse, the Bird, and the Sausage From Grimm's Fairy Tales By Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Edgar Taylor and Marion Edwards this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Once upon a time, a mouse, a bird, and a sausage entered into partnership and set up house together. For a long time all went well. They lived in great comfort, and prospered so far as to be able to add considerably to their stores. The bird's duty was to fly daily into the wood and bring in fuel. The mouse fetched the water and the sausage saw to the cooking. When people are too well off, they always begin to long for something new. And so it came to pass that the bird, while out one day, met a fellow bird, to whom he boastfully expatiated on the excellence of his household arrangements. But the other bird sneered at him for being a poor simpleton who did all the hard work, while the other two stayed at home and had a good time of it. For, when the mouse had made the fire and fetched in the water, she could retire into her little room and rest until it was time to set the table. The sausage had only to watch the pot to see that the food was properly cooked, and when it was near dinner-time he just threw himself into the broth or rolled in and out among the vegetables three or four times, and there they were, buttered and salted, and ready to be served. Then, when the bird came home and had laid aside his burden, they sat down to table, and when they had finished their meal, they could sleep their fill till the following morning, and that was really a very delightful life. Influenced by those remarks, the bird next morning refused to bring in the wood, telling the others that he had been their servant long enough, had been a fool into the bargain, and that it was now time to make a change and to try some other way of arranging the work. Beg and pray as the mouse and the sausage might, it was of no use. The bird remained master of the situation, and the venture had to be made. They therefore drew lots, and it fell to the sausage to bring in the wood, to the mouse to cook, and to the bird to fetch the water. And now what happened? The sausage started in search of wood, the bird made the fire, and the mouse put on the pot and then these two waited till the sausage returned with the fuel for the following day. But the sausage remained so long away that they became uneasy, and the bird flew out to meet him. He had not flown far, however, when he came across a dog who, having met the sausage, had regarded him as his legitimate booty, and so seized and swallowed him. The bird complained to the dog of this bare-faced robbery, but nothing he said was of any avail for the dog answered that he found false credentials on the sausage, and that was the reason his life had been forfeited. He picked up the wood and flew sadly home, and told the mouse all he had seen and heard. They were both very unhappy, but agreed to make the best of things and to remain with one another. 
So now the bird set the table, and the mouse looked after the food, and wishing to prepare it in the same way as the sausage, by rolling in and out among the vegetables to salt and butter them, she jumped into the pot. But she stopped short long before she reached the bottom, having already parted not only with her skin and hair, but also with life. Presently the bird came in, and wanted to serve up the dinner, but he could nowhere see the cook. In his alarm and flurry he threw the wood here and there about the floor, called and searched, but no cook was to be found. Then some of the wood that had been carelessly thrown down caught fire and began to blaze. The bird hastened to fetch some water, but his pail fell into the well, and he after it, and, as he was unable to recover himself, he was drowned. End of the Mouse, the Bird, and the Sausage